Hey everybody, welcome to the YouTube channel. My name is Reverend Daniel Hickson and I'm celebrating classic Christianity on this channel. And today I want to talk about what is the most important page in your Bible, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and I got to thinking about this question because of what recently happened at the Southern Baptist Convention. You may have heard about this if you kind of follow church news and whatnot. Um, a lot of churches and denominations, ecclesiastical bodies are having their their big conventions or conferences or, or gatherings this year. I went to the Anglican Provincial Assembly. The, the UMC General Conference happened this year. I, I did some reflections on that in another video. The GMC is going to have theirs in the fall. The, the PC USA just had theirs, the, PC, uh, the EPC. There's all these other ones. All these churches are having conferences. Southern Baptist Convention met this year. And one of the uh, proposals, and I can't remember exactly what you call them, but one of the proposals that was brought uh, to the floor uh, was that the Nicene Creed would be added to the Baptist faith and message as part of the official established standard teaching or theology or doctrine of the Southern Baptist Convention. And there was some discussion about this. There was a lot of discussion on the blog and, and YouTube world and, and Facebook forums and stuff like that. If I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the motion was sort of tabled for like further study. And so I don't know if it'll come back up next time the Southern Baptist Convention gets together or what. Um, and and I, ha I thought that was kind of strange in several ways. I kind of just assumed of course, Southern Baptists affirm the Nicene Creed. It's the standard of Christian orthodoxy that everyone agrees to, Protestant, Catholic, and Eastern. And um, some of the early Baptist uh, confessions of faith, like from the 1600s, officially affirm the apostles and Nicene Creed. So if the Southern Baptist Church today doesn't affirm that, does that mean they don't actually believe the same things as Baptists from centuries past? And Another thing that just kind of a question that came up to my mind was like, if you're going to have an up or down vote on creedal orthodoxy as it's been received by the entire Christian church, I would want to make sure I had the votes to get a yes before I even brought that uh, to the table. But anyway, this, this video is not really exactly about the Southern Baptist Convention, but it is about the relationship between the Bible and the authority of the Bible and the authority of the church as it's especially expressed in, in the ancient creeds. Um, and of course, that was one of the things that was being talked about and being discussed by, by people who were in favor of this proposal and people who were not so sure about it, or maybe there's a couple lines in the creed that they don't know about and uh, that kind of thing. Um, and that brought me around to the question of, of uh, the church's authority. What you will sometimes hear people say, and this is especially true with the restorationists, but this kind of idea, I think it's there in American evangelicalism, and I'm sure some of the Baptists have kind of picked it up as well, is, is we kind of, we want no creed but Christ and the Bible, right? We don't want any of that man-made stuff, any of that church stuff. We just want Christ and the Bible. Now, ironically, no creed but Christ and the Bible is itself a kind of a man-made creed. Uh, so, you know, I think to some extent you really cannot avoid, you cannot avoid those things. You have to be able to, in a succinct way, express your faith, a faith revealed here in the scripture in, in many, many hundreds of pages of text. How do you express that in a succinct way? And you have to, you have to be able to do that in, in words that people will understand. And so that's where confessions of faith uh, come from, that, that church bodies or church theologians or church leaders craft and put together. You really can't get away from that. But I, I called this video what's the most important page of your Bible? And this was a kind of a realization that I had when I was in seminary about the nature of authority, because the idea of no creed but Christ in the Bible is we just want, I mean, it really is like solo, not sola scriptura. Uh, the Bible is our highest authority, our only infallible authority, our only God-breathed authority, but, but really like our only authority. And we don't want any other authority at all. And I don't think you can actually do that. Even in the Bible, there are other authorities besides the Bible. The authority of parents over children is a God-given authority. Uh, it's not infallible. Parents are not infallible. But it's still part of the divine order, part of the divine plan. The authority of governments uh, is a God-given authority, according to Romans 13, and, and so on and so forth. So there are other authorities 
besides the Bible that Christians have always recognized and the Bible itself recognizes as legitimate. And one of those is the authority of the church. So I don't think you can get away from human authorities. The idea that we could just have the Bible all by itself, me and my Bible, no church in any way mediating my experience of reading the Bible, that's not possible. And here's why. What's the most important page in your Bible? Well, in one sense, it is this page. I, I, this is my uh, C.S. Lewis Bible, the one I had rebound a few years ago. You got, you got your uh, title page. You can't see that. It's tiny print. Here's the big print. You got your title page, and then you turn the page, and you've got the table of contents, right? And you've got these introductory essays, and then you have the books of the Bible. And what pages that are on there is the Old Testament, and then I turn it over, and here is the New Testament, uh, the books of the Bible. Now, when a lot of people, especially if they haven't really thought about it very much, talk about the Bible and the authority of the Bible, they almost talk as if one day God gave us the Bible, and it fell leather-bound, straight from heaven, just like just like the Bible you can go and buy at the bookstore, or buy on Amazon or at Walmart or whatever. And, and God like opened the heavens and said, here's the Bible, you know, King James Version, red letter edition. And, and, and then the church took it and read it and, and uh, tried to, to believe the promises and heed the commands uh, that we find there in order to be a holy and sanctified and saved people. But that's not really what happened. The, the story of how we got the Bible, it certainly was not originally like this. It was, and, and most people, I think, if they think about it for a moment and look at the table of contents, they realize it's, it's a number of different books that were written at different times by different people. As far as we know, they're all men, but we don't know who wrote some of them. Um, and um, so, you know, the prophet Jeremiah wrote the book of the prophet Jeremiah, or at least most of it. Um, some parts, you know, he's got students and scribes that may be helping and whatnot. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote the letters of the Apostle Paul. You get the idea, right? Uh, St. John the Apostle wrote the Gospel according to St. John. So you have these different books written by different people at different times. And these books were circulating. Uh, the, the Old Testament books, of, co of course, first were circulating and being uh, used by the Old Covenant people. You could say the Old Testament church, the people of Israel. And eventually uh, they were uh, gathered together under the authority of uh, the religious teachers and everything. And, and um, they were identified as these are the books of the Bible. For, for us, we would say the books of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. And then a similar process happens with the, the New Testament letters and, and gospels and other writings, they get circulated around, they get copied, they get shared, they get preached. And over a period of time, the church, through a process of kind of hashing it out, different church leaders, theologians, bishops, teachers, or uh, congregations are, are sharing with each other, well, these are the books that we're using. What are the books that you're using? And, and over time, a consensus emerged and you get the 27 books of the New Testament. And so if you think about that, um, and I'm gonna come back in, in just a minute and talk a little bit more nitty gritty about the Old Testament because it's actually a little more complicated with the books of the Old Testament. Uh, but certainly with the books of, of the New Testament, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, 27 books of the New Testament. And um, it was a process of consensus and recognition by the leaders of the church, the pastors, the bishops, the, the, the thought leaders of the early church that kind of sifted through, because there are other books that are Christian writings uh, from very early on, like the letters of Clement or the Didache. And there were some people saying, well, maybe we should put these as and count these as Holy Scripture alongside the Gospel of Mark or something. Um, but ultimately, the church sifted through and said, no, these books, not those books. So that was a decision, or, or a, a, it was a process of decisions that ultimately led to the final product that we believe was guided by the Holy Spirit. But it was a decision 
and a canonization process. These books were identified and declared to be the canon, the measuring rod. These are the books of sacred scripture. Uh, that was something that was done by the church. The church, the leaders of the church, the teachers of the church, the councils and, and synods and, and gatherings of church leaders declared these are the books that we accept. These are the books that are to be counted as sacred scripture, as the Holy Bible. Um, and so if you pick up a Bible or a New Testament and start reading it, you're only able to do that because the tradition of the church uh, gives you these books and not other books, right? If you didn't have a table of contents, if you didn't have an authoritative list of which books are the Bible, which books would you read? How would you know which books to read? Should we read First Clement? Should we read the book of Revelation? It's kind of strange, you know. Um, if you didn't have the authority of the church, particularly the ancient church, the early church, the church of, of the first four or five hundred years, if you didn't have the authority of the church saying these books, not those books, how would you really know which books to read? So the deal about that is it's also the church of that same period of time that gave us the Nicene Creed. So how can you say, I'm relying on the authority of the ancient, ecumenical, undivided church, the church of the early centuries, to authoritatively give me the table of contents for my Bible so that I know which books are sacred scripture, but I can't rely on the authority of those exact same teachers and councils and leaders to give me a... a, a a, a summary statement of the Christian faith in the form of the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, uh, which, which come from that same period of time. So you are always relying on church, on church authority, on, on the work of the church, uh, anytime you open a Bible. And, you know, I've heard stories of people who, and this is a good and beautiful thing, uh, you know, they'll go to a hotel room and maybe they're like down on their luck or they're having a, just a, a bad season in life and they, they open that drawer and they find that Gideon's Bible that's been placed there and, and just that individual with that Bible. This is, like, this is like the American evangelical vision, right? That individual opens that Bible and, and he reads it and he, he's, he's, he turns to just the right passage under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and he reads words that speak life to him. And, and his life is transformed and his soul is saved and he begins to walk with, with Christ by faith starting that day, right? That night in that hotel room. That is the power of the word of God that we encounter in the Bible. But think about it. How did that happen? Who put that Bible in that hotel room? Well, it was the Gideons. Well, who were the Gideons? Well, they are Christian laymen. They are members of a church and they... How did they get that Bible? Well, they, they translated it, they printed it, they, they had it produced and bound with money that was given to the Gideons by local churches. And they use a translation of the Bible, probably the King James Version or the New King James Version or the English Standard Version, I think that's all the Gideons use, that was translated by the church. If it's the King James Bible, it was translated by the Anglican Church, the, the Church of England under uh, the, the sort of um, the auspices of, of King James under his patronage, uh, a committee led by uh, Lancelot Andrews, great Anglican bishop and, and preacher um, and, and spiritual writer. He was the chair of this committee that, that put together the King James Bible. It was a project of the church. It was undertaken by the authority of the church. It's the authorized version, right? Um, same thing with those other translations. Who translated these Bibles? Well, Christians translated these Bibles. Uh, churches paid for them. And even further back, as I've said, which books did they translate from the original Greek or Hebrew into English so that it could be bound together, so that the Gideons could place it there? Which books are included? The canonical books are included, and they're the ones that the church, the early church, affirmed. These are the books that are sacred scripture. So it's the authority of the church. It's the efforts of the church. It's the translation work of the church. It's, it's the, the distribution work 
of Christian laymen, members of the church, that got that Bible into that hotel room. So that man who read that Bible, just him and the Lord and the Bible, you think there's the very picture of individualistic Christianity. Even that experience is only possible because it was mediated by the church. It was mediated by the authority of the church. So you cannot read the Bible apart from, literally, you cannot read the Bible apart from the authority of the church mediating that to you. And this is why... This is one reason why uh, in, in Anglican churches and Methodist churches and, and many others, Lutheran churches, um, I hope Methodist church, I have been to some Methodist churches where they don't do this anymore, but everyone I've been a part of did. Um, every week we say the creed, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, and it's a summary of what we believe. It's, it's, it's kind of a brief synopsis of the big story of the Bible. It's a naming of the God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in whom we trust. But it is, it is all of those things in words that are given to us by the ancient church. We affirm these things, and we say as part of the creed, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And we've got the creed precisely because we do believe in the Holy Catholic Church. It's on the authority of the universal church that we have this creed. It's on the authority of the consensus of the universal church that we have the books of the Bible. Now, um... That's kind of the, the overview of, of why, and I, if any Southern Baptists see this, maybe it'll be helpful in, in future deliberations. Um, but we really can't get away from the authority of the church. It's, it's literally not possible. So um, I'll go into a little bit more into the weeds of, of the Old Testament because it is a little more of a complicated picture. And some of you may know that. I, I had a friend in high school. We were... Uh, he, he and I were Baptists and at that time, and uh, we had a friend who was Roman Catholic. She brought her Bible to a, a Bible study we were having at um, our high school before school in the morning, and which is a great thing, right? Students getting together, different denominations, studying the Bible together. But she had her Bible, and we opened it up, and, and my friend John opened it to uh, a book that we didn't recognize. <laughs> it's like, wait a second, we don't have that book in our Bible. Uh, and it was like Second Maccabees or something like that. I don't remember what book it was. And and this raised a big question for us. Wait a second. Uh, there are slightly different lists, canonical lists of the Old Testament books. And um, and this has been a debated point uh, among Christians for a long time. And I'll I'll try to uh, show that that is the case. So um, this book, uh, Scribes and Scripture. Uh, the Amazing Story of How We Got the Bible, uh, has a handy little chart on page 121, and it talks about uh, listing the extra books, uh, or Protestants would say extra books, that other churches have in their Bibles. And so um, these books are usually called the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonical, that is secondary list or secondary canon uh, books. And so the Roman Catholic Church has all the books that the Protestants and the Jews because they have the same list. The Roman Catholic Church has all the same books that the Protestants and Jews have, plus Tobit, Judith, the Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, which is also called Sirach, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And then it has some additional uh, sections in the book of Esther, the book of Daniel, and also the book of Baruch, including the epistle of Jeremiah. So... Um, those are additional books that the Roman Catholics have. Now, the Eastern Orthodox, in their Bibles, the Greek Orthodox churches, have all of those additional books, and uh, First Esdras, Third Maccabees, and Psalm 151. So, and, and if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't know much about this, but I've been told that the, Ethi the uh, Ethiopian church uh, has even, even other Old Testament books that are not held to be canonical by the Roman Catholics or the Eastern Orthodox. So um, depending on what church you go to or were raised in, you could have a slightly different Old Testament canon. Um, and all of these canons have been attested at different points in church history. So the, the, the 39 book canon, the canon that's used by Protestant churches, was affirmed fairly early on by Melito of Sardis in AD 170. 
Uh, it was affirmed explicitly by Origen of Alexandria, who's kind of a weird and quirky guy in some ways, but a great scholar around the year 250. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, a significant church leader, affirmed the what we would call the Protestant canon in 350. Uh, St. Athanasius of Alexandria, one of the principal architects of the theology in the Nicene Creed, he affirmed this shorter Old Testament canon uh, in 367. The Synod of Laodicea, a, a conference, a gathering, a council of, of local church leaders, um, affirmed it before the year 380. Uh, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, St. Hilary of Poitiers, and maybe most notably of all, uh, St. Jerome, the great Bible scholar, uh, affirmed the Old Testament, uh, the, what we would call the Protestant Old Testament. Um, but then you also had major thinkers and leaders, most notably perhaps St. Augustine of Hippo, and early church uh, councils and, and synods, such as, I believe, the Council of Carthage. This is a different book, uh, Searching for Ancient Roots, In Search of Ancient Roots. Um, he's got a nice chapter on the canon. Um, the Council of Carthage in 397 affirmed the longer Old Testament that uh, we today would call the Roman Catholic Old Testament. So you've got major saints and fathers of the early church, as well as local councils, affirming both the shorter Protestant and Jewish canon, and also the slightly longer Roman Catholic canon. And uh, even up to the very eve of the Reformation, this remained a matter of some contention and debate. Um, you've got uh, early medieval figures like Pope Gregory the Great, John of Damascus, Hugh of St. Victor, uh, the great Franciscan Hebraist Nicholas of Lyra, all the way up into the 14th century. Um, and they all um, championed what we would call the Protestant canon, the canon that St. Jerome affirmed, um, all the way up to uh, a Roman Catholic cardinal and Franciscan monk, and I'm going to butcher his name, but I think it's uh, Jimenez de Cis Cisneros. Jimenez de Cisneros. I'm sure I butchered that. Um, was a Roman Catholic cardinal. He died in the year 1517, the same year that Martin Luther uh, nailed his, his uh, 95 Theses to the church door and started his Reformation. Um, this Roman Catholic cardinal sponsored a major uh, scholarly work of, of uh, scripture study. It had several different languages side by side of the whole Bible, uh, using all the oldest manuscripts they could find, and he used the Protestant canon the Protestant Old Testament, the, the Old Testament affirmed by St. Jerome on the very eve of the Reformation. And so uh, it's not the case. Sometimes you hear uh, Roman Catholic apologists on the internet kind of saying or implying, you know, this was sort of a settled question and then Martin Luther came and messed everything up. Well, the Old Testament, there was some debate about a few, I mean, it's only a few, a handful of books, um, all the way running through church history. And the approach taken by uh, the Protestants, and this is explicit in the Articles of Religion of the Anglican Church and the Methodist churches, is to affirm only those books that everyone affirms. And I think there's, there's, there's just some common good sense to that. Uh, if we are staking our salvation on, uh, you know, making sure we hear a word from the Lord, we want to be really sure we've heard a word from the Lord. And so... Um, Article 6 of the Anglican Articles of Religion, I believe this is Article 5 of the Methodist Articles of Religion, shared by the United Methodist and Global Methodist and other Methodist churches. It says, uh, it's talking about the Holy Scriptures, and it says, in the name, this is sort of the, the last sentence in the first paragraph, in the name of the Holy Scriptures, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament of whose authority was never any doubt in the church. So the 39 books that Protestants and Jews use and consider canonical from the Old Testament, everyone affirms them. Roman Catholics affirm them, the Eastern Orthodox affirm them, the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, they all affirm these Old Testament books. Nobody doubts that these books are the Word of God, uh, and, and they are sacred scripture, inspired and breathed out by the Holy Spirit. There's always been some doubt and argumentation about those deuterocanonical books. Um, but 
there is a genuine universal Catholic consensus regarding these 39 books. The, the entire church, the church universal, in all of its wholeness, and all of its Catholicity, affirms these books on my, tie, on my uh, contents page right here are indeed the Word of God, the Old Testament canon. There's no doubt about them. And that's why we can rely upon them based on the authority of the universal consensus of the whole church. And so that's, that's, um, that's Catholicity at work. And that's another way that you can see that we have to rely on the authority of the church and not just one particular thinker, one particular council, but a, a consensual authority, an authority of the whole, the universal, the Catholic, uh, the, the ecumenical church, uh, and say there's, there's a broad consensus here. This is reliable. This is trustworthy. This is sure. And you can do that with the, the, uh, the canonical scriptures, especially uh, the books of the New Testament, and the creeds, because the same people who are ha hammering out which books belong in the New Testament are the same people and the same churches and the same uh, early ancient Christian church that was also hammering out uh, what belongs in the creeds. And, and they speak with the same authority. And so uh, I hope um, this has been interesting. I hope it's been helpful and useful. If you want to check out uh, some of these books, there are so many books on this topic. This is one that uh, comes, I've only read bits of it. It comes recommended by Gavin Ortland, whom I, um, I really admire a lot. And I've, I've seen some interviews uh, with, with one of the authors and uh, thought he had some really good stuff to say and knew what he was talking about. Uh, if you like this content, I hope you will hit that thumbs up, share it with other people. And until we connect again, may the Lord bless you and keep you, give you his peace. Amen.